Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Well, welcome again for those of you who came during this sit, and uh, we'll start by going to the names. Um, so you know when I facilitate, I encourage people if they feel comfortable and want to also share their preferred personal pronoun. This is a practice that's done in a lot of communities now. It's an exercise to help um, create a space of more inclusivity for those who are not necessarily identified in binary terms. Um, so I'll start, my name is David, I go by he, him. Grisha, he, him. Christian, he, him. Greg, the same. Uh, Prasada Chitta, I go by he. Uh, my name is Harley. My name is Cass, uh, no, no proper. Donna. My name is Jerry. He, him. My name is Bob. My name is Jeff. He, him. I am Larry. My name is Matthew. He, him. My name is Ray. And Jack. My name is Dennis. I'm Brad. My name is Ella. My name is Stephen. Tim, he, him. Peter. Uh, John, he, him. My name is Mariana. Richard, he. Mark, he, him. And I'm Laura. Well, welcome, Laura. Um, Laura is a lay and trusted teacher in the Zen Soto tradition. Uh, it's been teaching children for the past 30 years, as well as teaching teachers on how to bring mindfulness to elementary school age children. Um, Laura is also a co-founder of the Sangha in Recovery program at the San Francisco Zen Center, and um, is an inviting teacher at the Lennox House Meditation Group in Oakland. Mm -hmm. well, welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you, David, and hello, everybody. So nice to be back. Uh, I really find that in, in uncertain times, it's wonderful to share the Dharma with each other because the timeless teachings of the Buddha are such a wonderful support when things seem to be, well, maybe they've always been slippery and out of whack, but seem to be even more so right now. I was talking with David uh, before we started that I do teach kids, and then I said, well, maybe I should say they teach me. Uh, I mentioned to him that one of my students looked up at me and said, Laura, do you have a real job? <laughs> <laughs> and we were on a field trip at the time out to the bay, and I, I think he thought, this is so much fun, it could be a real job. Uh, another one of my students, he was the youngest person at our school to come out as gay. And I was talking to him one day when he was in the third grade, and I said, you know, you're such a dramatic person. You have such strong feelings. And I wonder if you've ever thought of getting into theater. You know, I said, I grew up doing community theater. I majored in drama in, high, in college, and uh, I always wanted to be an actress. And he looked at me and said, so Laura, what made you abandon your dreams? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of drama in third grade classrooms. Uh, one of my previous visits, I talked about the Book of Joy, which is a wonderful book, uh, which was the coming together of Bishop Desmond Tutu and the 14th Dalai Lama in Dharamsala to celebrate the, the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. And this is such a wonderful book of these two great living masters that we have. And they talked about uh, cultivating joy. And in this book, uh, they talk about the eight pillars of joy. And I shared with you 
the first pillar, which is is perception. You know that in the world we have so many things we have no control over, but we do have some agency over where we choose to put our attention and our energies. And uh, so today I'd like to talk about the art of losing. The art of losing, because paradoxically, I think if we can adapt to a kind of joyful acceptance of loss, uh, it can really enrich our lives. So I want to start with a poem that you've probably heard by Elizabeth Bishop called One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seemed filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then, practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names, and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture, I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Elizabeth Bishop uh, from her complete poems. And this, uh, <laughs> this poem really resonated with me because I feel like I've spent a third of my life awake, a third of my life asleep, and a third of my life looking for things I've lost. <laughs> you know, I've lost expensive jewelry, uh, pearl earrings. I lost an antique Russian ring that I bought in a bazaar in Afghanistan. And, and it's sort of ironic that I, I had put it in the sleeve of my robe on the way into meditation, because we don't usually wear jewelry in the meditation hall. And I never saw that again. Many pairs of reading glasses and sunglasses, scarves, umbrellas, you know, mittens, gloves, my wallet, my car. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had this wallet. It was this beautiful green Moroccan wallet. I lost that wallet seven times. <laughs> and it kept being returned to me. People would bring it to my doorstep. You know, I had my ID in it. They'd mail it to me. It was incredible. And then that seventh time, it was, it was gone for good. Uh, I've lost money. I've lost my way. When I was drinking, I lost my self-respect and my dignity and years of my life. Uh, sometimes I think of the huge mountain of clothes and shoes and purses and hats that I've had through the years that I've discarded or lost along the way, but also just losing things. I think the only reason I still have a landline is so that I can call my cell phone <laughs> to find it, you know, because it's under the couch. Sometimes I even have to press the intercom feature on my landline to find my landline to call my cell phone. And, you know, I just, I, I have to say, uh, you know, I've come to accept this about myself. I try, but I'm probably never going to be the most organized person in the world. Uh, Sometimes, though, if I start losing things, in a, like important things in a row, it's a message to me that I'm troubled on a deeper level, that I'm preoccupied on a, on a deeper level. At the same time, sometimes we have to lose things or let go of things to make room for new things in our lives. Maybe that's why we lose things sometimes. Uh, there's something cathartic about taking inventory of all our worldly goods and getting things rid of things we never use, of clothes we never wear, and by the same token, letting go of people who are no longer nurturing us. We may have been in toxic relationships, even with members of our family. Sometimes the clarity of practice teaches us that there are people we can't have in our lives because it's not healthy for us. 
and we can let those people go, you know, with a full heart and with our best wishes, but it may be that we can't afford to be in their presence anymore. Letting go of old habits that no longer serve us, and taking off armor that no longer protects us. I think for those of us who grew up in alcoholic homes or with mental illness, we had to protect ourselves with a kind of armor. Uh, and taking off that armor that no longer we no longer need, it might just dawn on us, I don't need to protect myself in this way anymore. I can open up my heart in a more vulnerable way because I, I've come to terms with certain things in my life. Sometimes it's only in hindsight that we realize that some of our greatest losses were for the best. I mean, in my example of, of giving up theater, although I'm still in this Buddhist puppet show, and, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the Vimalakiri Sutra as a musical comedy, and I, I, love, I just love doing that. But, you know, I had to realize that I, I probably wasn't talented enough or dedicated enough to theater to dedicate my life to that. I really couldn't deal with the insecurity of, and the rejection that's part of theater life. And yet, the, you know, my ability to sit here with you is, is part of that uh, public speaking that I learned how to do. It's, it's something that's still part of my life, but I think in a more wholesome way than it was when I was in theater. Um, this story just occurred to me. When I was in monastic training at Tassajara, in the middle of a practice period, we would have a skit night. And so I spent many periods of zazen writing the skit in my mind. And it was called The Wizard of Zaz, The Wizard of Zazen. And it was about a, a young girl. Of course, I got to play Dorothy because I wrote it. You know. Growing up in Salina, Kansas, who comes out to the West Coast to seek spirituality. And, ends up in this monster. And so I asked different people, you know, I had a lion and a tin woodsman and a scarecrow, and we had a lot of fun. There was a lot of laughter and applause, and I felt just filled up with this, um, the wonderful outpouring of what I felt was love, you know, when I did this. It was my job that night to ring the bells to send people off to bed. So there I was with this huge gong in the dark, ringing this bell, and I had my hair in braids and this gingham dress, where I got that in a monastery, I don't know. Uh, and I had tears running down my face because I'd had this moment of clarity that, that I had done this whole performance because there was a kind of emptiness inside me that I wanted to fill up with the love of an audience. And I realized that was a big part of my motivation for being on stage to get something that I needed that I hadn't gotten in my life. And I made this vow that I would no longer put myself forward in that way until I had come to terms with my own motivation. And it was a long time later that I felt like I had integrated myself enough that I could offer these kind of things as a gift instead of as an ego trip. Does that make sense? That I, I, I no longer felt that there was this hole inside of me that I had to fill up. A lot of that had to do with getting sober. You know, many people who are in recovery say they felt they had a hole in their chest. When I heard that, I, I was amazed that other people felt that way too. So losing things we hold, we hold dear can sometimes open up whole new vistas for us that we couldn't have imagined. And at other times, we might be haunted by the memory of something or someone that we let go of prematurely, and we hadn't recognized the value of that person or that, uh, that thing in our life that was so compelling. Uh, we didn't recognize its value. There's a very famous Chinese story called A Blessing in Disguise that I think relates to this theme of loss or letting go. You've probably heard the story that uh, there was a man who lived in the, at the foot of some mountains with his beloved son. And their livelihood was finding and training wild horses. And one day, his son rode off on a white mare and came back leading a black stallion uh, that he'd found in the mountains. And all the neighbors came and 
applauded them and said, this is wonderful, this blessing in your life. And the father said, we shall see. And so it so happened that when the son was trying to tra train that black stallion, he fell off and broke his leg. And then all the neighbors said, this is a terrible mm -hmm. tragedy that's befallen you that your son is now disabled. And the father said, we shall see. And then a time of con war and conscription came and the son was passed over. He couldn't be in the army. And he stayed at home with his father. And the neighbor said, what a blessing that is. And the father said, we shall see. <laughs> so we don't always know. You know, the results aren't in yet, in other words, of any event in our life. Uh, we can't always see the blessings that might be present in loss and disappointment. Practice encourages us in a way to throw everything up in the air and uh, all our cherished beliefs and our limiting identities and ideas. And I think that's what happened to me as I was standing ringing that bell, that this identity as a performer that I was so attached to, I had to let go of it for a while. I think we can underestimate, too, that we, we also need to grieve for some aspects of our old ways of life. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who worked with death and dying, outlined different stages that we go through when we confront our own or another's imminent death. Uh, the, the stages that she outlined were denial, you know, first we want to pretend this isn't happening, anger, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to someone I love? You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Bargaining. You know, if I, I promise I'll just do this if this isn't so. And then depression, which is a, on our way to acceptance. We, we might become very depressed and uh, a kind of surrender to the situation. And finally, acceptance. And I, I went through all these stages when I gave up alcohol and everything that went with it because it meant I was giving up my identity as a wild woman and my friends who drank like me. And there may, there may be an analogy for that in your own life of some maybe self-destructive habit or pattern you were in and you had this moment of clarity that you, need, you, you knew you had to give up that identity or that old way of being and thinking in order to open the door on a new way of being. A divorce can be like this, or any big transition or loss in our life, the loss of a career, or a, uh, of a romantic relationship, or of a, a friendship that's changed dramatically. I kind of liked the wild woman that I was when I drank. You know, drinking gave me permission to be wild. And, um, and it gave me many things. Because of alcohol, I was brave enough to travel with my boyfriend at the time through the East. We traveled overland from Europe to India, spent <coughs> quite a bit of time in Afghanistan. And I, we were so naive. I was 20 years old, you know, and people did disappear on that trail. That sometimes it was called the Hippie Trail. Mm -hmm. And we did find drugs and alcohol along that trail. But I was very grateful for it that I was brave enough and silly and, you know, <laughs> and, and naive enough to take that trip through the wilds of Afghanistan. And because of alcohol, I could sing in bars and in front of large groups of people. I could dance all night and talk to anyone. Spent a lot of time in the Red Dog Saloon in Juneau, Alaska. And uh, it was fun till it wasn't fun anymore, you know. I ended up in a cabin in the snow contemplating suicide. And there was just a little sliver of hope, though, that maybe if I stuck around, there might be a more abundant life at the end of my drinking. And I came, I left Juneau, Alaska, came back to San Francisco, and I started looking for a spiritual way of life. I had this idea that maybe uh, if I could find a, a group of people that wanted, wanted what I wanted, which was a spiritual way of life, I could, in a sense, redeem or save myself. Uh, I love this phrase from a E.E. E. Cummings poem, I who have died am alive again today. I who have died am alive again today. And that's how I feel as a recovering person. You may have had a brush with death or have lost someone you love dearly and had to come back from that. 
and had to find a new freedom and a new happiness in your life. In practice, we can transform our loss and our grief when we step onto the bodhisattva path. I feel like I've done this by extending a hand out to other suffering alcoholics. Uh, the bodhisattva path is to live and be lived for the benefit of all beings, to break out of our stagnant pool of self and extend <clears throat> ourselves to others in whatever way we can. And I, I trust that each of you has found a way in your life to extend yourself to others, either through your vocation or your avocation. Uh, Suzuki Roshi, who founded the Zen Center where I practice, San Francisco Zen Center, said, shine one corner of the world. Pick something. You know, we can't save the whole world, but we can pick something to do to help others, whether it's hospice work or just smiling at a stranger on the street. Um, I, who have died, am alive again today. We can transform our grief through identification with other suffering people. And in Buddhism we call this tonglen, where we, we breathe in the suffering of the world and send out life and light and help. Uh, you know the figure of Avalokiteshvara? She's probably, yeah, there she is on the altar. It's said that Avalokiteshvara hears the cries of the world. But actually, we are Avalokiteshvara. We are her agents. We hear the cries of the world. And when a suffering person, when we hear their suffering and I identify with them, we are Avalokiteshvara at work in the world. And this is truly a kind of alchemy. You might say spinning straw into gold, to refer back to the Rumpelstiltskin story. We find that the very places where we're broken and grieving are the places where we can connect with another broken or grieving person. I know this happened in a very deep way during the AIDS crisis, which of course isn't over yet. Uh, Suzuki Roshi said, life is like getting on a boat that's about to sail out to sea and sink. <laughs> then he laughed. <laughs> So this great truth of impermanence is always with us, you know, the art of losing. You know, this, um, there's a wonderful phrase in practice that I love, which is, uh, all that you love will be carried away. I wish I could say that was from a Buddhist sutra, but I found that in a Stephen King book written in a <laughs> phone book, in, in a phone book. All that you love will be carried away. And this is a very kind of bittersweet truth, you know, but to open ourselves to love, it means inevitably we'll get hurt. You know, even if we're with this person for the rest of our life, they will die or we will die and we will suffer. Um, but C.S. Lewis, a very interesting figure, he was Christian and uh, expressed his Christianity through his wonderful children's books, such as The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he said, love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap your heart carefully round with hobbies and little <clears throat> luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, and motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakably, impenetrably, and irredeemably solid. To love is to be vulnerable. And I'd like to mention the Diamond Sutra. We chant the Diamond Sutra at Zen Center. And when I was new to Zen Center, this just seemed so crazy to me. They hand out the, chat, the, the chant books, and everybody opens these books at random, and they just start reading. And so everyone around you is reading different things at different mm -hmm. times. And I, I came to find out that the point of that is that the entire Diamond Sutra will be read at one time. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be covered by everybody <laughs> reading different things at the same time. 
And there's this wonderful kind of poem. It is a poem, the Diamond Sutra. Like a falling star, like a bubble in a stream, like a flame in the wind, like frost in the sun, like a flash of lightning or a passing dream, so should you understand the conditioned world. I heard uh, Gretel Ehrlich, you may have heard of her, she's a naturalist and a Buddhist who studied in Japan. She said that Japanese culture is rooted in the contemplation of beauty against a background of impermanence. And that makes me think of cherry blossoms. And by the way, there's a wonderful movie called Cherry Blossoms by Doris Dory, a German filmmaker, about a man who goes to Japan because his <coughs> wife dies suddenly and she was never able to go to Japan to study kabuki theater as she wanted to do. And he feels sort of guilty about this, so in her honor, he goes to Japan to see Japan through his eyes for her. And he, they're just these beautiful, his encounter with cherry blossoms and with impermanence. Cherry Blossoms, a really beautiful movie. Uh, and they celebrate cherry blossoms. <coughs> we have a cherry blossom festival here in Japan town. Until the 1800s in the West, uh, there was no such word as Buddhism. The word Buddhism was created in the West by Buddhist practitioners. But up until that point, Buddhism was just called Dharma practice. And I really love that Dharma practice uh, it's an action we take in the world. We practice the Dharma against the background of impermanence. Dharma is the teachings of the Buddha, but also just the way, the truth, or the path. You might also say that Dharma is just the way things are, just the way things are. Everything that we experience is a Dharma, and our, our conditioned mind wants to pick and choose. You know, we want to say, well, this is good and this is bad. I want this. I don't want that. This person can be helpful to me. I don't want to have anything to do with this person. This is worthwhile. This is a waste of time. But strictly, everything that arises is part of our life and part of our practice. We often speak of living in the present moment or the power of now. But Actually, by the time that we realize we've heard a sound or had an experience or seen a person or uh, tasted a taste, felt a feeling, it's already gone. By the time we apprehend it, it's already gone. As, you know, as it says in the Dharma Sutra, like a, light, like a flash of lightning, uh, like, a, like the dew on the, on the <coughs> sky, like the moon on the lake, the reflection of the moon on the lake, it's already a memory, like the light from the stars that we see today, but which left those stars thousands of years ago. And when we sit, and it's so helpful to sit together as we did, to sit in community, we practice watching our thoughts and feelings arise and pass away. This is the practice of Dharma. Meditation isn't emptying our mind or becoming a better person. Uh, we already are ourselves. It, sometimes it means clearing, clearing away some of the obstructions to that person that we are, but um, we practice letting our thoughts and feelings come and go. And this is great practice for those things in our life that come and go. We follow our, our breath for a little while and then some thought comes along. We follow a storyline. We remember our breath and come back to the present moment. So this is an experience of impermanence. This is the practice of Dharma, one of Buddha's great teachings. Thank God for term limits, for example. <laughs> Someone once asked Suzuki Roshi if he could only say one thing about Buddhism, what would he say? And without skipping a beat, he replied, everything changes. Of course, I always have to add, except Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> no, she never changes. <laughs> and here, here's a wonderful paradox as expressed by the wonderful astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. And you can see this on YouTube. I, I, it's uh, an interview between Stephen Colbert and 
Neil deGrasse Tyson and Colbert, not in his persona as a, a right-wing pundit, but uh, just as himself. He's a very bright man, of course. And he was interviewing Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he said, what is something in science that's beautiful? And Tyson said, without skipping a beat, E equals MC squared. But then he gave it a little more thought, and he interrupted himself and said, you know what else is beautiful? That the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucible in the center of a star that manufactured these elements over its lifetime, went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxies, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star, and have the right ingredients <coughs> to make planets and people. That means we are part of this universe. And not only that, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept, and I think the greatest gift that astrophysics has given this culture. And it came from a research paper published in 1954. We are stardust, and we have known it since the middle of the 20th century. So I love the paradox, Buddhism's all about paradoxes, and I love this paradox that we have in permanence. But here we are, stardust, you know, that we are made of stardust. And as the desiderata points out, you are a child of the universe. You have a right to be here. I was in Yosemite a couple of summers ago, and I went on an astronomy walk, and... Um, the astronomer that was giving this talk said something that just blew my mind. I mean, I'm lying on this big rock looking at the stars every once in a while, a shooting star is coming across. And you can see the Milky Way. It looks like it's out there, but we're part of the Milky Way galaxy. And he said, if our own solar system was the size of a quarter, the Milky Way galaxy would be the size of the contiguous United States. And we can hardly wrap our minds around that. But, you know, teachings like that for me really help put things in perspective. You know, as, it, as, as Humphrey Bogart says in Casablanca, the problems of three little people don't, <laughs> and don't, um, don't oh, no. match a hill of beans in this crate. Thank you, in this crate. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I need you to come through this. <laughs> So thank you very much for listening, for your very kind attention. And I, I'd like to open it up for discussion. And uh, please talk about whatever came up for you in these teachings. But if there was a time in your life where you lost something that you really regretted losing and grieved over, and yet looking back, that loss might have led to something in your life you couldn't have predicted, it might be very helpful for us to hear about that uh, as a theme. But again, whatever whatever you'd like to talk about, of course. So thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> a wonderful talk. I uh, could relate to a lot of it and uh, have had much loss in my life and dealt with addiction and, and that hole in my heart. And for me, recovery has been about getting comfortable in my own skin. And, uh, but I often forget that as your God of meditation pointed out, it's to, our purpose is to enjoy being here. It's not all about the first double truth. You know, somebody said to me the other day, it's hard being me. And I say, it's hard being in a body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Being in a human body predicates loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't make me call on you. <laughs> well, I'll just add on to that, especially in an aging older body. Um, 
So I, before I moved to San Francisco in 1980, I lived in Denver and uh, I worked for a corporation and I was managing a restaurant there. And things weren't going well and they said to me, we want you to transfer back east. And I said no. And uh, so I really had to look at things and I used to come out here and party in the late 70s and said, oh, if I come out here, I'll die. <laughs> but uh, so they kept pushing me, pushing me, and finally they fired me. And uh, um, having a large ego at that time and being so young, and I went to directly into pain and suffering and, and uh, not looking at this could have been an opportunity. So my roommate from college lived in San Francisco, so I made the jump to move to San Francisco. And um, going through all that pain, it was worth it because my next step was to move here. So. Mm -hmm. And we're glad you did. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. And we have, our life is very parallel. I'm a recovery a teacher, and um, I'm actually <coughs> becoming a mindful schools, mindful teacher person. <coughs> um, but what came up for me when you said live for the benefit of all beings, which is um, something I need to hear more often, um, that's when I feel the best, is when I'm living for the benefit of all beings. and. The loss I had recently was uh, my Aunt Betty, and it was my dad's only, no, no, it was my dad's sister. Um, she was uh, an inspirational woman. She just, she died at 95. Mm -hmm. She fell and broke one hip, and then she wasn't going to let that stop her, so she went to rehab, and um, she broke her other hip, mm -hmm. and that stopped her whether she liked it or not. So, but she, in her life, she, um, married uh, a drunk, abusive drunk, and had three children, and then left that guy and went out and was a single mom. Um, she was one of the first commercial airline stewardesses, you know, like she did all this crazy stuff. And she went back to school several, several times. She had a number of master's degrees and an honorary PhD, and she started a Montessori school. She went to Mexico and just lived in this commune village to help these children. And, like she just did all these amazing things for the benefit of other people. And um, she remarried at 86. Mm -hmm. um, and so she just, um, she passed suddenly. I mean, she broke her hips and she died within about 10 days. I mean, it was really kind of fast. And, but through that loss, um, members of my family united in uh, Texas, where she was in a nursing home, or in an assisted, li assisted living place, and there was so much joy that she brought into the room. You know, her her daughters were all kind of fragmented, and they all came together around her illness and eventual death. And I saw cousins I hadn't seen since I was like eight years old, and they were lovely people. Uh, like mm -hmm. I forgot, you know, like there's some stuff in the DNA that. Um, that I want. <laughs> um, there's also some of the DNA that was present that I didn't want any longer, so I had to, like addiction and things like that. But um, just the the reminder of how people like her and like the Buddha, people how they live for the benefit of others, and it can just renew and refresh my own commitment and inspiration to stop worrying about the crap. You know, and like focus on um, something else you said. I can't remember the quote, but that kind of idea, like these beautiful moments, this, these opportunities for joy, to focus on those and, mm -hmm. and nourish those and, and yeah, celebrate them. Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing her to life for us. Mm -hmm. She's still alive as long as you remember her. Yeah. Yes. This is slightly off the main focus, but you said something very early that was sort of almost shocking to me about a third grader coming out. Mm -hmm. And can you just say a little bit about, you know, what environment he was in, or yeah. you know how he was able to do what? What you understand about that? Well, he came out in fourth grade, but still, that's very young, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, I think he just felt. The permission to do that. You know, my school is a progressive school. Uh, we have a lot of gay families in our school. So 
I mean, one day in my class, someone used the word gay as a pejorative, and I just said, let's stop everything. Raise your hand if you love someone who's gay. And, you know, we could all raise our hands. So we talked about that. So I think maybe he just felt, and, and loving parents that gave him permission to be who he was. Plus, it was kind of obvious. <laughs> <laughs> He was given a lot of, I think the kids at my school are given a lot of space to be who they actually are. And I feel that I, as a teacher, have been given that space too to be, I'm a little quirky, but uh, you know, I've been given a lot of creative freedom at my school. And I, I really value that now, and I realize not all teachers have that. I mean, especially in the Midwest, you know, that there's certain values you have to promulgate whether you believe in them or not. But it was very inspiring. And a number of, uh, some of our middle school kids have come out as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. A couple of things. First off, I just want to mention that uh, last Sunday was the Oakland Pride Parade. Mm. And it was just amazing. Um, needless to say, there's a lot of uh, women with kids and men with kids in Oakland, much more. And it was amazing that there are all these elementary schools that were in the parade and mm. that my kids from kindergarten and up were like being exposed to their parents and everybody else and young kids. And there were young kids that like had signs, you know, I'm gay. I mean, it was just really mind-blowing how from we old guys building <coughs> up and building up the... Uh, the opportunity for these next generations to be so much free. But it was just amazing, all these little kids, and they're like, it's just natural and normal. And I, I imagine some of those kids at that young age would say, hey, that's me too. Yeah. Uh, just saying about loss, I think I have a couple of examples for me. I just remember one time when I first finished the university and I was uh, supposed to get this great job and it was perfect, they loved me, and they loved me. it turned out the last minute they hired somebody that was a relative, you know. And it was just devastating, you know, like I have to leave the Bay Area, and, you know, horrible. And it turned out, after a while, I did get another job that turned out to be wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. who knows, but, you know, to uh, connect me to uh, this uh, life of travel and international connections and best friends and, you know, so that sort of is good. Um, the other thing is, like, I think all, most of us, went through in the 80s, you know, with the AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. which was <laughs> loss, 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 mm -hmm. like 28 every day. And, um, you know, they often say about how with all that horrible loss, we developed community, <coughs> we developed uh, uh, caring community, compassionate, taking care of hospice and Shanti, and I mean, all these organizations, and all this political stuff, you know, after Harvey Milk was killed and then the AIDS thing, I mean, it was like at the lowest point, but then we did develop this incredible power, though the loss is still there, I mean, even today. I mean, I'm seeing how we increased our strength and our power and our self-esteem, but still, you know, there is so much sorrow and sadness that, you know, it all comes together. I mean, it goes together, the 10,000 sorrows and the yeah. 10,000 blessings. Are, so we have to keep that in perspective. But I am challenged now, I think, as I'm progressing in years, mm -hmm. that there are some things that look a little lost, and hopefully there's a window out there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you lose track of it, thinking that it doesn't yeah. work out. But again, with practice, there's always that hope and there's always that calmness to you know, just trust that things will work. Though, as the bumper sticker says, shit happens, you know? <laughs> but still, to have that practice, to have that inner feeling that things will work out, even if we go through some horrible things and difficult times, and, and even with pain and suffering, there's wisdom and insight mm -hmm. and uh, uh, ability to adapt and adjust and make it on that ship. <laughs> wherever it's going. Thank you for that. Yeah, I like to say, when one door closes, 
Another door also closes. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to find the window. <laughs> but thank you for saying what you said because it's so important to realize that it's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. That there is this tremendous flowering of community and strength and support and <coughs> identification and love and coming out in this joyful way. And then this, the grief of the losses we all felt during the 80s. And they're there, they're both there. And um, it's not, it's certainly not one or the other. So I'm glad you mentioned that. We have time for another, yes. Uh, I lived in New York when the AIDS wave broke and I had a very, very dear friend, Walter, and I'll go into all the reasons he was such an amazing, wonderful person. I inherited his memory box, which is a, a time center's box, and in each piece he has some asset, his, his uh, identification bracelet, his St. Mark's Bath card, you know. <laughs> and I have it hanging over my dining room table. And it's a constant reminder for me of gratitude, the gratitude that he was in my life, that some of the things he did enabled me to buy my condo. And just that I'm, I survived. I, I was a, I'm all the things I've done. Sometimes I'll wake up in a really shitty mood and I'll look at that and I'll go, you know, thank you, Walter. And it's just like, yes, there's always challenges, but like the gratitude thing is just something that I'm really uh, grateful for. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. There was one other. Yeah. Well, you were talking about theater. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading last night uh, about the various productions of Angels in America. Mm -hmm. And when they were in 1993, uh, in previews in New York City, um, Tony Kushner was sitting in the audience, much to the director's dismay. <laughs> had tons of criticisms about the performance. And the, the woman playing Harper, who was addicted to Valium, Marcia Gay Harper, mm -hmm. at that production, she was wearing a wig. Um, and then the Tony Christian looks at him and he says, that wig's got to go, the wig's got to go. And George Wolf, the director, okay, the wig's got to go. Well, Marcia Gay Harper did not want to get rid of the wig. She liked it. This was in the preview still. And there was this big fight over this wig. <laughs> <laughs> At least we have our priorities straight. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, finally, uh, they prevailed, and she lost the wig. But then she felt very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And she went into the next performance, it was, they said, <laughs> that was it. Losing the wig um, made her vulnerability sort of part of the performance. Oh, and, uh, wow. So I thought of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Well, I just want to say, because this came to mind as we were talking, that um, I have a very good friend that I've known since I was 11 years old, and she helped her mother through the dying process. And I went to see June shortly before she died, and it touched me so much. She, she took my hand, and she looked up at me, and she said, Remember me. Remember me. And... You know, against this backdrop of impermanence, to remember one another in the way we have today, people who've died. There, there's a wonderful thing in um, Corelli's Mandolin that said, when someone, this, this is, I think, helpful for all of us when we think of loved ones who've died. When loved ones die, we have to think of the things they used to say and say those things ourselves and think of the things they love to do and do those things in their stead. We have to be glad we're alive and feel the joy of that and also the pain of the loss. And this meant so much to me, for example, when my father died because we would swim together every day at this club on Fillmore Street. And when I swim, I feel like I'm swimming for my father because he's no longer in a human body and he can't do that. But it's a way of me being with him. And I do think that as long as we remember people who've died, uh, they're alive for us. So that's a some, something of a comfort in the midst of such loss we endure as people. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any announcements, Richard? Yes, the uh, GBS retreat is September 28th to 30th. There's still a few spaces left. And if you're interested, you can talk to Jerry or I, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. 
Jerry, please. I'm Jerry, I'm the host today. And somebody's pushing my chair. <laughs> uh, there's refreshments, there's hot water for tea. When you're finished with your cup, put it in the dishwasher. Um, like we mentioned before, at 12.30, people go to lunch. There is a sign-up sheet if you want to be in the GBF directory on the credenza right out here. Um, yeah, you know, the announcement counts. Yeah, uh, we could use a host on the final weekend of this month. It's um, because of the retreat, and it's also the Folsom Street Fair. Um, we don't have a host right now, so if anybody wants to um, try it out, there's no contract, no commitment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I, have, I have an announcement. The book group that I helped administer, I guess, Radical Dharma Study Book Group, we're going into our next book right now, and we're going to spend two months on it. And it's a book called Race and Religion in American Buddhism. Um, and it's a bit of an academic. It's not that big, but it's pretty dense. And it's, it's, really, it's very interesting. It's about how white supremacy has shaped Buddhist religious practices in America, and basically how whiteness is really embedded in American Buddhism, something we don't necessarily talk or think about much. Um, how Theravada Buddhism got here, like the spirit rock tradition, but how much, like, the analysis of how much whiteness is kind of embodied in there. Um, so if you're interested in taking a look at that and being a part of a study group about that, let me know because this is a ridiculously expensive book because it's an academically published, it's published by a university, and it was an academic study. Um, <clears throat> but for the group, we are making digital copies available. So for those who are committed to the group. So if you're interested, like talk to me afterwards. I'm going to put a piece of paper out, and I can put, um, you can put your name and email address. We are also shifting um, the way it's been, the book group's been going. It's been very much like facilitated and led by Daigon. We're moving away from that to be more of a round table discussion format, <coughs> probably because of Daigon's schedule, but also by the wishes of the community, the group. Um, so I'm kind of taking a little bit of the lead on this, only just as facilitator, but for the most part, it's going to be like group-driven um, in the process. Um, so let me know. And, and it'll be like, we're meeting, I believe, on the 11th, I think, um, October. Uh, so if you're interested, let me know. So And then I guess the other announcement is um, next week. Mm -hmm. Tom Moon is going to be talking, and he's uh, been a practitioner of Vipassana meditation for 15 years, uh, and he's a psychologist here in San Francisco, primarily working with gay men, um, and his passion and commitment is to working with the interface between Buddhism and psychology. Yes? I forgot about Donna. Donna is a poly word for giving. Uh, I'll be coming around with Donna Bowl, and uh, suggested uh, donation is $10. Yeah, and we'll hang out until about 12 30. If you can, visit. Some people go out to lunch. Um, great to see everybody, and thank you again, Laura. Thank okay. you. We're okay. going to stand up and do the dedication of merit. I want to thank you so much for having me. I'm always struck by how quiet and peaceful it is here in the middle of the city, and the quality of this community really touches my heart. So thank you. Hey, does anyone want to um, do the dedication of merit? <laughs> Can you do the dedication of Mary? Um, you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> you have a, I have some, a different one memorized. Yeah, yeah, whatever, for your own way. Your own way. Yeah, all right. It's funny to hear from someone that's doing it their way. But I knew you were a teacher, so I thought, all right, thank you. <laughs> May the merit gain in our acting thus go to the benefit of all beings. I'm, do, I'm saying our, and usually we say the same I, so I'm trying to do that, so I might stumble. Um, uh, may the merit gain in our acting thus go to the benefit of all beings, our personality in our many ways, our possessions, our merit in all three ways, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> may they, uh, may the merit gained in my acting thus go to the benefit of all beings, my personality, my merit, and my possessions in all three ways, 
I give up without regard to myself for the benefit of all beings, just as the earth and the other elements are serviceable in many ways to the infinite number of beings inhabiting limitless space, so may I become that which maintains all beings situated throughout space, so long as all have not attained to peace. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.